Okay, so we've got this mathematical representation of a traveling wave. And the part I wanna look at, so we've got a traveling wave coming uh, from left to right. And it hits a wall and bounces back, gets reflected. We talked about the fact that that could happen last week. And we said that if it's a fixed end, right, if, if, the, uh, if it's a string that is, you know, pinned down at this end, that we get an inversion uh, of that reflection. Instead of a, an up pulse, we get a down pulse. And that down pulse gets sent back this way. So we've got an, a normal traveling wave traveling from the left to the right. And when it hits that fixed end, we get an inversion. So we get an upside down wave traveling the other way. What does that look like? What does it look like? Because we know that two waves coming towards each other can superpose. We add their effects and get some kind of net thing. That's the interference that we talked about last week. So what does it look like if we have a wave that hits the wall and comes back upside down? How do, how do they combine that way? So well, let's play. This is a wave traveling to the right. A wave traveling to the left. And that is upside down. Now, traveling to the left just means we have to shift the graph the other way, which means add the plus sign in the argument instead of the minus sign. So we're going to try to add these two things and see what we end up with. Okay, for the sake of keeping the algebra as clean as possible, I'm gonna make a couple simplifications. Two pi divided by lambda. Reminds me a little bit of 2 pi divided by the period, which is how we defined the angular frequency back when we were talking about oscillation. So 2 pi over how much time it takes, we called that the angular frequency. This is 2 pi over how much space it takes. So this is a spatial frequency a spatial radian frequency. This is radian frequency for time, and this is radian frequency for space, because we're taking two pi radians and dividing it into an actual length measurement. I'm gonna call this K. It gets a horrible name. Uh, it gets called wave number, but just it's the, it, what it actually is, is the radian, or I guess, I guess we should put spatial first. Spatial radian frequency. That's, that's really what this is. Uh, it's just, we give it the name wave number. All right, so I'll change that, make that K. There's one more, we gotta distribute, I don't really like this like parenthesis thing. So what if we distribute two pi over lambda through the parentheses? So then we've got two pi over lambda times V T. <clears throat> so 
this is a relationship that we developed last week. We said that this wave speed is the wavelength times the frequency, or in other words, the wavelength divided by the time. So this V we could replace two pi lambda over capital T, that division by lambda is still there, and then we're going to multiply by a little t. The lambdas cancel, 2 pi over t, I just had that written, that's omega. So the second term, all right, so we distribute 2 pi over lambda through the minus, through the parentheses, that v in the front gets us omega. So I'm going to rewrite this as kx minus omega t. k in this case isn't a spring constant. It's the spatial radian frequency. It's the wave number. Uh, so we'll make that same change here. Ax plus omega t. Okay, the other thing we need in order to make this work is a trigonometric identity. There's a, there's a couple that will work, but the one that I remember is the sine of a plus or minus b. And the identity, it's sine of the one, cosine of the other, plus or minus cosine of that first one times the sine of the second one. So we've got one each, sine and cosine, sine of the first thing, cosine of the second. If this is a plus, this is a plus. And then we switch which, uh, which argument gets the sine of the cosine. Okay. Ready? Y1 plus Y2 equals. They both start with an A, so I'm going to pull the A out front. Sine of something minus something. Well, that's sine of something minus something. So we can rewrite it this way using a minus sign. So we've got sine of the first thing cosine of the second thing minus cosine of the first thing sine of the second thing. That's this. So we're going to add this, but that starts with a minus sign. So really what we're doing is subtracting minus sign of the first thing, cosine of the second thing. This is a plus sign, so we use the plus version of the identity, plus cosine omega, uh, no, cosine ax sine omega t. All right, so I don't know how that helped. Uh, things are getting much more complicated. This minus sign, we subtracted a thing that we expanded using identity. Let's distribute that minus sign so that we don't need parentheses anymore. This one is just here, so that's fine. Minus, let's make that a plus sign. This term a negative and this term a negative.
sine kx cosine omega t, one's positive, we're going to subtract the other one, those are going to cancel. Minus the thing, minus the same thing. Okay. So this is y1 plus y2 equals a. Mm, there's a minus sign here, so it's minus 2 cosine kx sine omega t. There's no good way to put it back into kx minus omega t because we don't have sine, cosine, plus cosine, sine, or anything like that. So we're, we're sort of stuck, separated like that. Which means Got a piece of this that has a that is fixed in time. Cosine kx, as we've got the the whole thing we're talking about. If it's a string that's you know fixed at both ends, we've got some cosine shape that goes. And that's the shape, that's it. It's got some amplitude and it has some shape. Cosine of kx as x advances across whatever that wave number is. And then we multiply all of it by sine omega t. So all that does is take this shape and multiply it by something between 1 and 0 and negative 1. So we take this shape and scale it according to 1, 0, negative 1. If we multiply this by negative 1, we could end up with a shape like this. And as time goes on, we actually see this, this string just sort of make what, what we call um, nodes, points where destructive interference happens, and anti-nodes, places where maximum constructive interference happens, depending whether it's, uh, you know, whether sine has a value of one or negative one. But as we watch this thing vibrate, we see these, these uh, you know, antinodes, places where there's a large amplitude and then zero amplitude and then large amplitude. And we just see these nodes grow and shrink and grow and shrink. And they don't really seem to go to the right or go to the left. They just sort of oscillate up and down because all of the spatial stuff is fixed and we just let it oscillate in time. If it's spatially fixed, just oscillating, it doesn't really look like it's traveling anymore. We, we don't have an argument that's shifted across the graph anymore. Now we just have a function whose amplitude changes with time. So we aren't changing the 
the left to right picture, just the vertical picture. It's not a wave that's traveling. It's a wave that's staying put. It's a wave that is, uh, we call it standing, a standing wave instead of traveling. If both of the ends of that string are fixed, in other words, this point cannot have any oscillation. It can't move from here because it's nailed to the wall. Then that limits the shapes that we can fit. If, uh, if I tried to draw something here such that the function, oops, let me use the right color, such that the function got to here, got to you know a, a trough, let's say, and this was the wall, there's, that can't happen because that the string is tied to the wall right there. We can't actually have a, a trough or a crest or anything other than a zero right there. So we need to only consider wave sizes that fit within the left to right space that we've got. Only certain waves are allowed, and if only certain frequencies are allowed, if, if the wave travels in this string with a certain speed, if only certain wavelengths are allowed, only certain frequencies are allowed, and that's why only certain pitches are heard by us, because only certain frequencies are actually allowed to exist. So, what is the speed with which waves in a stream travel? And this is a, a piece that I think we, uh, that I skipped over last week as well. And it's the speed of waves in a medium. On a string, um, uh, like a guitar string or a piano string, the speed with which the waves travel is related to the tension that we subject the string to and what I'm going to call mu, which is not the coefficient of friction that has nothing to do with that. Mu here is the linear mass density. It's how much mass does the entire string have divided by its total length. If we, if we assume that it's diameter is very, very, very thin compared to its length. So we, all we really care about is how much of the string are we talking about. And, this, and the shorter the shorter the guitar string, the less of the total mass we're talking about, but it's the same linear mass density, right? If we take a string and only let half of it vibrate, it's still only as dense as it was. So that's it's the same mu. OK. So because waves travel this fast on a string, then that speed is related to the size of the thing that we can allow. Those wavelengths can only exist such that there are nodes at the two ends of the string. And that's where I'll hop back into the slides. So I'll stop it here so that we can put it into nice chunks and then I'll hop back into the slides.